Deciding to be an entrepreneur, how do you find something you're passionate about and you're like, I want to go try this and build it? Like it has to be so deep in your soul to stay committed through all the tough stuff that happens when you're starting a company and knowing that you're committed to this for a lifetime. Can you define what a land steward does and what their responsibilities are? Land steward is a phrase I'll use interchangeably for ranchers or farmers who are focused on restoring ecology as an important output of their work. So prioritize prioritizing the health of the soil, prioritizing biodiversity, all these great inputs in the system that create longevity and ultimately to grow healthy food for generations to come. How did you get 100 customer interviews? Having a yeah. good support system is also very important. What does it take to start big successful companies without some of that burden of venture capital investors? Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Jesse. She has over a decade of experience driving transformation at various startups and unicorns, companies like Spruce, Degree, GE. She's a Terra.do Climate Fellow, a member of the Soil Health Committee at B Carbon, an entrepreneur residence at Antler, I'm guessing Antler Austin. Mm-hmm, yeah. And then a three-time startup exec, and you've brought some companies to the number 10 uh, best list for Inc. 5000. Mm -hmm. Correct as well. Financial, uh, number 10 in financial Finance. services. Number 10 in yeah. financial services. She's currently the founder and CEO of Downland, where you're matching landowner with next gen land stewards to restore landscapes. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm so One thing I like to start off with is just understanding where would you say your entrepreneurial journey started? Mm. Uh, I, I think like a fun answer to that is. The uh, being a bossy kid on the playground, it's like, oh, we're going to play this game and you're on this team and you're on that team and you do this. Uh, and I think always had those bossy in a negative way, entrepreneurial leadership yeah. skills uh, is, a, is maybe a better way to put it. But uh, where it actually began uh, most recently was uh, last summer I was laid off from my job and anyone who got on LinkedIn any day in 2023 knew how rough it was out there for people who were job hunting. I felt like every other day I had a friend or a colleague who was like, you know, gosh, I got let go. It's been months. Yeah. I got mouths to feed, like yeah. tough stuff. And I was in that boat and uh, a lot of the hardest decisions I've had to make in life have been a very black and white, like this door is closed, this one is open. So you gotta go through the open one. And entrepreneurship was that open door for me where I was able to take this passion I'd been kind of cooking around with for a couple of years and turn that into my full-time thing. Out of necessity. Nice. Uh, I think even 2024 at the time of this recording, they've been roughly 90,000 layoffs this mm -hmm. year in tech, mm -hmm. right? So again, not the best market. Also now companies can be a lot more pickier mm -hmm. because they have a lot more people to choose from. It's not like 2021 where there's like not enough people to hire. Mm -hmm. And people are being more picky about, okay, I can find the right person because there's like 800 people to choose from. Mm -hmm. And it's, you have to be a lot more particular about like your skill set you're offering. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is not the best market to be looking yeah. for a job. I had had a t uh, I had been job searching and took this um, personality assessment, and they showed the results back with me, and were like, "You don't fit in any of the categories. This is like a nineteen or you know fifteen nineteen archetypes in this personality test. There's one we don't tell you about, and that's the one you have. And seeing things like that, being like, "Oh no, I'm unemployable." Like. Yeah. I have to be an entrepreneur now. <laughs> Makes sense. Deciding to be an entrepreneur, going to start your own company, how do you find an idea? How do you find something you're passionate about and you're like, I want to go try this and build this? Mm. I, I think it finds you a little bit. Like it has to be so deep in your soul to stay committed through all the tough stuff that happens when you're starting a company and knowing that you're committed to this for a lifetime and is it something you've already been doing that you love that you care about is it something that you will do on the bad days on the hard days on the no pay days how will you continue pursuing this idea for me that started from an early age so the summer i turned 16 i got my first car what was your first car my first car that i purchased your or... first car you drove okay you, yeah, yeah that it you was were like, a... this is the one i 
drive to school. It's a Volkswagen Golf. Cute, yes. Hatchback, yeah. Yes. Well, the like Indian it. version of it, but yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, mine was a 95 Chrysler LeBaron, and it was red. It had a soft top. The driver's side door didn't open, but it was, it was mine. And uh, I bought it scrimping and saving my ice cream shop money yeah. from the last couple summers. And when I got my car, that came with responsibilities, right? You have to, you know, drive your siblings around. You have to uh, take care of the car, make sure it has gas, all that sort of stuff. And one of the responsibilities that I took on was uh, taking care of my grandparents at the end of their life. And it was a very hands-on and transformative experience. But it also instilled in me this really deep commitment to like, man, I don't want the end of my life to be like this. I want to hedge against sickness for as long as possible. And that meant that I was going to figure out what that took. And you don't pull that thread very far to be like, oh, a healthy diet, exercise, these things are important inputs to a long and healthy life. And oh no, our food system is kind of screwed up. And so I have had that passion for a long time and pursued it in a lot of personal uh, personal pursuits and hobbies and side jobs. And as an adult, my professional life hadn't really come together with that. And with my work with Downland, thinking about the future of the climate, the future of food, and making sure we have uh, people equipped to steward land, kind of that skills matching piece, those are the things that I get excited about and I've been excited about and now I get to work on them all day. Nice. Quickly, just for the audience and also make sure I understand, can you define what a land steward does and what their responsibilities are? Yeah, and there's a broad definition of land steward that uh, I'll use for There's a definition of land steward I'd use today and one that it evolves into in the future as part of Downland's vision coming to life. And today, land steward is a a phrase I'll use interchangeably for ranchers or farmers who are focused on restoring ecology as an important output of their work. So prioritizing the health of the soil, prioritizing biodiversity, all these great inputs in the system that create longevity, that create climate benefits, and ultimately sustain our soils to grow healthy food for generations to come. And if you remember the food chain, the nutrients in the soil get in your food, get in the animals that eat, and that food get into us. So it all is all connected in that way. Um, And so land stewards today are helping steward land using the methods of ranching or farming, but prioritizing those principles. In the future, I would love to see land stewards thought of as asset managers, folks who are managing our assets of nature, food systems, uh, the assets of landowners and those stakeholders, and shifting that mindset of uh, extraction to building to growing. I like it. And in terms of just understanding what kind of landowners should be looking or would be looking for land stewards, who comes into that bucket? There's a few folks who I think about when I think of personas of landowners that we encounter. Primary, there's some primary ones and some secondary ones. The primary persona of landowners that we talk with are folks who own land as an asset, who maybe don't know what to do with it. Uh, they purchased it. They maybe uh, go hunting or holiday or you know weekend on that land, uh, camp stuff like that. Um, but they don't really have an aspiration of how to turn that land yeah. into a productive agricultural business, but they may have an alignment or interest in doing so because it's cool, because they care about the things that we care about, about the longevity of our food systems, about the climate. And so they want to get involved in downland can help put someone who's skilled in place to support that. The other main persona we encounter of landowners are folks who've been in an agricultural family before this land has perhaps been a farm or is a farm 
but it's in transition. 1.5 million U.S. farms are going to change hands in the next two decades. Okay. That's 70 percent of the farms in the U.S. And there's many who don't have an heir to manage that land or have an heir who maybe wants to own it but not run it. Yeah. And as people are making those decisions for their families, they're sort of like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I, where do I look? Who can help here? Um, what are the options that I have? And uh, those are our main landowner personas. I, I get a few other conversations that I'm very interested in the evolution of this space. Uh, one example is uh, agro-tourism. Okay. So envision um, a retreat center, a wedding space, um, things like that. And the farm is an amenity as part of that. There's also a real estate application here. Imagine neighborhoods where the golf clubs and, or what are they called, golf courses? I don't golf. Um, the country clubs and golf courses. Imagine suburbia where the golf courses are replaced by farms or the next generation of communities where a farm is adjacent to your playground and your swimming pool surrounded by homes. And so um, there's this emerging kind of agro-tourism, agro-real estate development sector that I'm very curious to see okay. how that emerges in the coming years. Pretty cool. I have a couple of follow-ups there, but so go, <laughs> um, going back to your journey, you Can decide I ask to, you a question, actually? Yeah, for sure, for sure. When I tell that story, when I tell the story of my grandparents, kind of a new thing for me to ask about what other people's, you know, what was your first car? And then I kind of come up yeah. with like this kind of yeah. negative, like bad news thing. But I think it's a good way to like engage people. I'm curious if you were like, no, no, no I like, like, no, I, that was I, I like to the, talk about that. no, I like yeah. the reason because um, I think a lot of people want to understand how your brain works, how do you mm -hmm. think, how, why, why does X, Y, Z make sense, right? Because yeah. what, what I'm trying to sort of capture with the podcast is, hey, when you're starting a company, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, hey, spin up a website and go do then build this, right? Mm -hmm. And w when you were saying that, my, I had a conversation, with, I, I think a guest a couple episodes ago or someone outside, but you gotta be so in tune with your idea that mm -hmm. you will not quit mm -hmm. because there's gonna be so many times when something doesn't work and you're like, fuck yeah. it, I just wanna yeah. move on. Right. But if you're passionate about the idea, you, you power through those and you're like, you know, it's not, I'm not ready to quit yet. Mm -hmm. And I think you really need that or else you're gonna have a lot of half-baked executions mm -hmm. And I, I think that story sort of hones down that point of like, there's a reason, there's a motive, and like you see an end goal. And maybe in two years, God forbid, there'd be a signal where like, okay, maybe this isn't working. Mm -hmm. But at least you went the three, four, five years yeah. because you had the whatever drive behind you to push through those. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's very easy to find a reason not to do something. Yes. And you need the reason to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. But... No, I like I like the analogy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to your journey, you decide to do this. You had you had an idea, you had a passion. Um, what's your first step? How do you how do you go about it? Uh, commit to going. I was in this sort of decision mode of like, do I keep job hunting? Do I take some time to really um, invest in this idea? Invest in what I've been working on? Continue this research and because I had lost my job, it was, and I was having a tough time getting the next round of job interviews going because of the nature of the market at the time. I was like, well, I have to, I guess I'm gonna do this. And I did get a signal from Antler that sort of nudged me in that direction. I've talked a lot about open doors and closed yeah, doors. And yeah. that open door was going to Antler's Accelerator. They had called me and asked to participate in the interview process. And got through that and was like, okay, let's. This got the yes. Twenty three. This is fall of uh, yeah, fall of okay. twenty twenty three. Nice. Nice. I got the cold LinkedIn message. I think I'd maybe been on an email list okay. at some point, but who'd you talk to from Antler? I spoke with Sam initially. Okay. And 
and uh, Perna and Joe did my interviews. Got it. Yeah. Nice. And once you're in Antler, that's your decision to like, okay, I'm going all in, or were you still half in, half out? I was all in, and I ran really quick to start. Uh, the first couple weeks of the programming take up some time in your day, kind of onboarding stuff, yeah. AMAs, and the then you sort of, as the programming sort of dissolves away and it's time to go, that's when I was going. I did about 100 customer interviews in two weeks and was sick with the flu the next. So I don't. it was seasonal. It was the time of year probably. Maybe I went too much in the first two weeks, but uh, that was... So talk through that process. Mm -hmm. Why do 100 customer interviews? Mm -hmm. How are you getting these mm -hmm. customers on board? And what, what signal are you looking for in these customer interviews? Yeah. I got some advice through Antler I got some advice early on in this process that if you don't love talking to your customers, you're in the wrong business. That's another really great signal for people to take of, you know, if you go to events in your sector or the sector you're interested in, and you're not just like enthralled by the speakers and you're not like, you know, staying up at night, like reading your notes under your covers with the light, like a kid, you know, reading their like, yeah. Or a book or whatever, the that's a signal that you might not be in the right space. Yeah, and I had those signals really early that I love talking with my customers. I loved learning about the things they were learning about. I loved all the complex interactions of our food system and the give and take of a lot of the policies that happen of the decisions that farmers and ranchers make. And I had to reorient myself with what those needs were early in the process. Part of the reason was I didn't do that to start. I built something on the side a couple years ago. Uh, I thought it was gonna be something easy to turn on and that's not what it turned out to be at all. Uh, I took for granted that e-commerce is a very specialized uh, skill set and sector on its own. Um, so dabbled in that uh, when I was working on downland on the side and learning about the sector in general. So I knew I had to start all over. Yeah. And that's what I did when I got there. So how, how did you get 100 customer interviews? Because I feel like when you talk to early stage folks and you tell them, hey, go do customer interviews. They're like, I don't know how to get people on the call. Because mm -hmm. it's, unless you have a lot of connections, it's very hard to get 100 customer interviews. How did you go about just like getting those on the book and having those calls? Mm -hmm. And I had started having these customer discovery calls on the back of two and a half, three years of research Got it. before I even began. So I had started accumulating some of that personal network as well as my own personal network from my career pursuits previously, where it that wasn't necessarily in the same sector, but coming from the Midwest, it's not too hard to meet someone who's a farmer. Yeah. I had a cornfield in my backyard growing up. It wasn't my cornfield, but we had drive your tractor to school day and we got off for the fair and nice. I had friends who showed goats. So I was sort nice. of, you know, there's my personal network, some yeah. of that career network and, um, folks who are just willing to help. So I didn't start from zero with Makes customer sense. interviews. I had started with building that network, going to events and learning about the industry Makes sense. ahead of that. And in these customer interviews, what are you asking? What kind of signal are you trying to get? And what I'm trying to highlight for listeners is when you're doing these customer interviews, you're looking for some sort of validation, mm -hmm. right? That, okay, do people want this? Do they not want? Like, am I on the right track? Not right track? Mm -hmm. And you have to avoid getting a false positive, which is yes. basically telling them, "Hey, here's my idea. Would you buy this?" Everyone's gonna say yes, yes. right? So you gotta like, you know, beat around the bush to sort of get the answer out. What were you doing? How were you like? What signals were you looking for from these calls? We were starting from a place of problem discovery. Our interest in those calls was to understand what problems do you have? What barriers are you facing? And what are the biggest barriers that you need help taking down? Because if they're ones you can do yourself, 
Mm. We don't need to build a big yeah. company around that. And so we were starting from a place of open handedness, of listening, yeah. of trying to understand what problems were before we had a solution in place, before we really understood what, um, you know, what the tech was going to look like or what it needed to how it needed to function. Those things we just didn't even have in our mind. It was like yeah. customer, farmer, regenerative land steward. What do you need? Or when you were on this journey yourself, if you're someone with more experience, what helped you get over these barriers of adoption? What helped you create the resources and the conditions you needed to have faith that you were gonna be successful in this business? And that curiosity led us to understanding what the barriers were and who was ready to take advantage of assistance in overcoming those barriers. Um, so for example, we talked to a lot of folks who shared that, um, how do I wanna say this? This is like the, how do I talk about petty farmer bullshit without yeah. being degrading question? <laughs> The So some of the things we wanted to understand from people who were in the process of transitioning or had transitioned to regenerative agriculture, what got you over that hill? And that was where we found our ICP was finding people who had made those transitions, what kind of people and resources they had around them to make that, and how do we recreate that for more people? Makes sense. Very random sidebar. You said regenerative farming. I met someone a couple, probably 12 months ago at this point. Uh, she's big into regenerative farming and she does like these tours for people to like go out to regenerative farms. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's such a niche that I would never even know existed mm -hmm. unless I was in that space looking yeah. for that. But just very random. Agrotourism, I just heard this yesterday. Agrotourism is a emerging industry, it's valued at about $5 billion, but it's forecasted to grow to about $10 billion by 2027. So it's okay. growing really quickly. And I think that creates a really interesting culture shift dynamic where people start to value food and farms and are putting yeah. their money forward to pay for that. And I am curious how that sort of changes consumer demand for food at large. Yeah. I was volunteering with Farm Share Austin and the woman who was helping coordinate the volunteers for the day, we were harvesting carrots along this row and she was kind of on the far side from where I was. And she would like pull a carrot out of the ground and just be like, wow this is so cool. And she'd hold it up and like show it to us or like we'd come in and like taste pieces of it. And that's the kind of person I want harvesting my food. Like I want an artful like carrot display in front of me and I want someone to pull these carrots out of the ground in, in this like see-through yeah. thing while I'm sitting at a fancy countertop in Sonoma, California. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's a fun experience to envision. And someone tells me about soil aggregates and fungi and nematodes yeah. while I'm sampling my carrot. Like that's a fun future to envision where we value the output of mm -hmm. farmers, the process of what they're doing and what the soil's contributing to that process as well. I, I think there's a nuance to customer behavior changing over time. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it will change, but I think where this may hit some roadblock eventually is just scalability, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because my understanding is regenerative farms are not the most efficient, optimal farms. Mm. Like you get good output, it's good for the ecosystem, but you're not getting your like, you know, per square foot area. I don't know what the measure, like KPI yeah. for a yeah. farm. Yeah, you're not yeah. getting the best yield per mm -hmm. whatever, right? And that's good, but then cause consumers also need to then realize that, hey, it's gonna cost more. Mm. And so there's always a trade off, right? And I think eventually at some point it's going to hit a tipping point where, okay, they're only ready to pay this much. Mm -hmm. And, but that's not sustainable for mm -hmm. the person. And I feel like eventually, like right now it's an experience, so it's different, but if it becomes a way of life, it's going to hit some bottleneck at mm -hmm. some place. But it's my very naive understanding. There's about five objections in there that I'm like, yeah. Ooh, I got yeah. that one. I got that yeah. one. Uh, and I think there's, you know, certainly <laughs> agrotourism is its own sector of like, luxury and privilege 
that has a place, right? And there's, you know, if I want to go have like a special dinner, like I should be able to do that, whatever. The, um, I think there's some really interesting opportunities when you think about regenerative farming as shifting the mindset of what success is. One, there's more places that we can start to think about what are the value of those assets? The farmers being paid as a service provider for improving Makes that sense. land asset. Today, if you get appraised land that's regenerative or not, there's not a delineation, even though the longevity and productivity of those yeah. parcels yeah. are very different. So there's a whole new sector to be built yeah. there. There's also regenerative farms are 120% more profitable one of the reasons is because you're significantly reducing the inputs required because you're not having to compensate yeah. so much for the lack that the soil has. And so that's a place where it starts to shift that conversation. One of the projects we're working on that's also really interesting are food as medicine pilots with a few groups in Indiana, uh, some groups here locally as well, of how can we pilot meal delivery um, to folks who have chronic health conditions. This has been done in a few other places. How can we pilot meal delivery, meal delivery to folks with chronic conditions with meal plans that have been nutritionally prepared and approved for those chronic conditions like diabetes? There are places where those meals can be purchased with Medicare and Medicaid dollars and how does that help subsidize this cost of food in a way where corn and soybeans get some of those subsidies today, organic farms and other farms don't, maybe that subsidy doesn't come from commodity prices and offtakes like that. Maybe that comes from our healthcare system where we actually reap the benefit of better food. Makes sense. I like that. So going back to your journey and I interject a lot because my mind goes places. You're doing but, great. Um, you do these I, customers. I'm taking us a lot of different places. Too. Uh, I like to rattle, and you, you, you guys can. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. I'll fix it in post. <laughs> um, you do the customer interviews. You get validation. What's the next step for you? Mm -hmm. You, you're understanding what people are wanting. What do you go do next? We use the signals of understanding what our customers wanted to translate into a business model that delivered their needs. So the things that we heard landowners and farmers really needed as they were starting to make these transitions were access to land, access to capital, access to training, uh, and some tertiary ones around uh, waste management, uh, supply chain coordination, things like uh, storage, processing, packaging. Um, those were some of the themes that we heard all of which are in industry unto themselves. We didn't hear anyone talk about profitability. That was a good thing. We also didn't, um, we also had this, uh, the signal we got from customers was also one that I call community, but I think encompasses much more about these beliefs that regenerative agriculture is part of where we're going of how we must steward the land. It is the right way to do things, sort of this moral pull, this conviction, uh, spiritual connection, strong sense of identity in regenerative agriculture and land stewardship being a core input to the future of food. And those things meant we needed to solve problem we needed to solve problems that our customers told us they wanted solved. And so we took that focus of land and translated that into a marketplace business model. And this is where some of my experience in marketplace business models became valuable. Some of my skills as a super connector became valuable. And that's where you start to see a lot more of my fingerprints on the business and that founder market fit or founder problem fit, founder solution fit, yeah. whatever phrase you want to use for that. Those were the places where my ability to support these solutions started to show up was in the business model and the tech we would need to build to surround that and support that. But ultimately a marketplace is about connecting supply and demand, 
managing and mediating the needs on both sides and creating shared incentives for everyone to participate. And those were the things that I've been learning from marketplaces since I've worked them since 2019. And how I saw my skill set being particularly applicable to addressing some of the problems that I heard with this ability to access land for the next generation of farmers and ranchers. Nice. Sidebar and marketplaces. <laughs> uh, marketplaces are notoriously difficult to build out. Yes. Because unless you have an edge on one side, you're always straggling for mm-hmm. both sides of the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And then you it's very hard to get to a point where, oh, hey, I have enough on both sides mm-hmm. to make this work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you mentioned you, you had a lot of connections. Super, you could get... I at least started with one side, but you still got to go get the land stewards mm-hmm. and get mm-hmm. them on. So you have an idea, validation. At, at this point, you're still just a solo founder, correct? Yes. Um, who do you go to when you have a problem? Mm. How do you how do you tackle that? So let's say you have the you know what you want to build. You realize okay, marketplace is where we're going. How do you transition into figuring out how to build that? Plus, when you're two co-founders, you can like bitch to each other about what's not yeah, working. Yeah. What do you do when you're a solo founder at this point? Yeah, it, it depends what's not working. And that's where my network and skills as a super connector come in really handy. As I was starting, I had to get brave about asking people questions about yeah. what I was doing. I remind myself often, you're not stupid, you're just at the beginning. And in particular, I've been employee number seven, I've been employee number 100 or so, employee 15,000, 300,000. I've seen companies at a lot of different stages, but I've not been employee number one. one. Yeah. And that comes with a whole different set of challenges and just steps, administrative things you need to do, legal stuff you gotta get done. And fortunately, I, have enough business acumen to know that there are whole departments at big companies that do just this one thing. And I cannot possibly presume to know everything about that one thing. Yeah. And so when it comes to answering legal questions, when it comes to answering accounting questions, contract questions, I have folks who I know have that expertise. I have projects and experiences where I've gotten to flex in that space a little bit As a generalist, I've dabbled in a lot of things. And I know I don't know how to do all of them 100% well. I can maybe do some of them 10 to 30% well, and that might be fine. Um, But having that network to tap into has been super helpful. When I need support uh, for the bitching and moaning kind of stuff, uh, I have a partner who is extraordinarily supportive. And I was really fortunate that when I started this journey, even though I was facing the uncertainty of a layoff and the income challenges and questions and fears that come with that, a lot of other parts of my journey were pretty solid. My fitness routine was in a good place. My relationships and friendships were in good places. I had found good restoration Uh, meditation, sleep, food, all that stuff was really in a good spot. And so that meant I could have instability in one of these other areas of my life because I had stability in many others. And that's advice I would give. If you have the opportunity to start a business, look at all the aspects of your life and understand where you'll maybe make some sacrifices in those realms I spend a lot less time with my friends because I'm working on my company. Um, but I have great friends who understand that sacrifice yeah. and they're still, you know, they're yeah. with me and they support me. Yeah. And um, so knowing that there's going to be uncertainty in this one area of life, how can you eliminate some of the uncertainty and challenges yeah. that could come from other parts of your life? I think that's super important because as an entrepreneur, your goal is, I just got to make this work. Mm-hmm. And so you tend to skip, avoid, not worry about anything else. Um, and it's very easy to just get lost in that vision and the, like, I just got to go, 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 right? Mm-hmm. I have a friend, um, 
he started a year and a half ago, two years ago. And the other day we were chatting and he's like, I've gained 55 pounds in the last year. Yeah. And he's like, I didn't even realize that this happened. Mm -hmm. And it's just you, like you just tend to neglect things that don't seem important because they're not like moving the business forward. Mm -hmm. But you got to realize that if you're going to like put too much effort on one lane, eventually like you hit a plateau and mm-hmm. like then you'll have a you'll have a couple of weeks where you just can't get anything done because mm-hmm. like everything's off right mm-hmm. but i think balance super important. but like having a yeah. good support system is also very important yeah as an athlete i think about this idea of balance in the form of pacing yeah like if i'm going to i do crossfit that's my method of training yeah. so if i'm going to go do a workout that is four minutes long i'm if i'm going to go do fran uh for those in the know that is going to be a very intense effort for a very short amount of time. Yeah. I'm not taking a break. I'm not stopping. I'm running from thing to thing to thing. And I'm going to be done in four minutes and I'm going to lie on the floor for 12 minutes after that. But in a workout where I'm going for like 20, 30, 40 minutes, that's paced very differently. Yeah. That means I'm going at 70% effort. I'm maybe taking slower transitions between things. And I translate that into the way I think about pacing myself in my work. Yeah. For example, I thrive on a work day that's nine to like three, but every day of the week with one or two really long days in there. Um, I know I'm gonna sacrifice my sleep one or two nights a week, uh, but I know I'm gonna get really solid sleep the rest yeah. of the week. and. Um, Leaning into that pacing is something that's really helped with that longevity. And keeping that stress low, I think, can also just prevent you from making bad, hasty, desperate decisions that you'll regret later. Random sidebar again. Yeah. Um, you know who Tia Toomey is? Yeah. Uh, there's a meme I was watching the other day where there's a video of her um, doing, what's the movement? Um, doing snatches. Uh-huh. And she, this is before she had her baby. Yeah. Like, so she's like seven months pregnant. Mm-hmm. And then the next scene is another woman who's pregnant sitting on a couch eating ice cream. And she's yeah. like, is that what you're supposed to do? Like, and it's just a, yeah. like an athlete thinks about it differently. Like she's seven, eight months, but she's still working out. She's still doing the mm-hmm. movements that are safe to do. She's still keeping her body in shape um, even before having the baby because mm-hmm. that's just her routine, that's what yeah. she does, right? And she's and, a professional athlete. Yeah, yeah. And I think about, I, I was thinking about that this weekend. Uh, so the CrossFit semifinals just happened. Yeah. There are a lot of folks who go to that who are kind of on that line of like, I'm a full-time professional athlete versus I'm someone who maybe works at a gym yeah. and have some flexible schedule and people who have regular everyday jobs and still CrossFit like a badass. Yeah. And I gave myself the prompt the other day of like, if I were a professional athlete, I would absolutely be prioritizing my sleep, my nutrition, my mobility, my recovery, so that I could perform my best when I'm on the field, because I know everything else in my life is supporting my time on the field. And I think as an entrepreneur, you can take that same mindset. Like I'm going to be excellent on the field if I've taken care of all these other things. And that prompt of like, what does a professional athlete do? Like you're a professional entrepreneur, yeah, it's your 100%, 100%. job. You should be thinking about it the same way. How do you optimize your ability On to- On field versus off field. Yes, exactly. After Matt Frazier, um, I know a little too much about CrossFit, but- Oh, uh, I, oh we've picked a topic, uh, oh no. But uh, also I, I think about this a lot. I, there's a ton of overlap between the resilience and grit you need to train at a high level as an athlete and to be an entrepreneur. And I've gotten to see a lot of that overlap as someone who is decent at CrossFit, is a state level Olympic weightlifter. I've put some time into my training and I have some sense of what it takes to excel and build skills and learn new things and fail and deal with that failure in the context of sport and learn to deal with that as an adult. I didn't like play a lot of sports growing up, so it's 
I've had this very like kind of heady experience of like, how do I be a good teammate while I'm in my 30s? <laughs> like that's a thing you kind of figure out when you play t-ball and yeah. I just never had the experience. So I'm using my experience as someone who's found athletics as an adult and been a little more cerebral about it and applying some of that training, pacing, longevity into entrepreneurship. And the reason I, I think what you said is super important for like on field versus off field, like you gotta, you, you gotta be good across the board. You can't just be like, hey, I'm only going to do entrepreneurship and like fuck everything else. Mm hmm. And the reason um, I say that is I was watching a Matt Frazier interview after he like retired from CrossFit and he's like, we would pick a hotel where they would let us bring our own mattress. And when he would check in the yeah. week before the games, he's bringing in his own mattress. His, he's basically bringing in all his own furniture. That I have needs. that mattress. It's a good mattress. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, that's a level that you don't see people going to mm -hmm. just to perform. And at that point, it's not like he's, the prize money is so, like he's probably like if he wins he makes 100k mm -hmm. he's probably spent more than that just in that two weeks of prep up before and all mm -hmm. the travel and everything and that's where you realize you got to be really good off if you want to be really good on on the field and i was like oh maybe he just like shows up right but like, <clears throat> there's a lot of like pre-work mm -hmm. that goes into mm -hmm. um but yeah and he talks about all these like uh, health and nutrition hacks that he figured mm -hmm. out along the way and he's talking to people who are experts to like I just need you know half a person of an edge because mm -hmm. that will help me mm -hmm. beat everyone else um, I'm but, fortunate that this the space I'm working in helps me learn about food and nutrition yeah. and where our food's coming from and all the things that I can kind of apply to my yeah. everyday life. So I get a little bit of a hack yeah. in working on these spaces, but that also is why I'm working on it in general. Cause I'm like, I think about these things off field all the time. So how do I start getting to do them on field? How do I get to do them in the industry? How do I get to drive change and use my skills in this thing that I care so deeply about? Makes sense. What's your favorite CrossFit movement? Ooh, um, I love overhead squatting. Okay. Um, I love pull-ups. Like barbells, kettlebells, what kind of overhead? Yeah, squatting? barbell, overhead barbell squatting. Single arm dumbbell snatch is a weird thing to do. It requires like a lot of precision and balance. Yeah. All the things I can't do right now because I have a rotator cuff and labrum tear that I'm recovering from. But um, that's nice. Where, where do you do CrossFit in town? I coach CrossFit at Sola CrossFit on South Lamar, so I train out of there. I also work out at Lumos Fitness Collective. Okay, I don't know Lumos Fitness. They're a little uh, sneaky garage place in okay. uh, uh, Burleson and Old Torf. So the neighborhood, okay. the yeah. neighborhood's I mean, a little shady. I've been, I've been north yeah. for almost a decade, so uh, yeah. anything, no reason anything south of like Congress, yeah. I'm probably not even aware yeah. of like what's going on there. Yeah, I have that same feeling. Sometimes I drive like up to like North Lamar, or we used to live in Cedar Park when we first moved here, but I'm like, I forget, like, oh, there's just all this stuff in between yeah, here. Yeah. Going back to your journey, you figure out, okay, marketplace is what you wanna do, and like you're, you're toying around with what the product would be. What do you do after this? How do you hone down what you're building, how you're building? Mm -hmm. How do you go about those steps? And. As we were thinking about what the business was going to look like, we started to need to take some signals from investors, from venture, from other successful businesses and understand what's fundable, what builds a big business, what provides some of the metrics that marketplace investors expect, that venture investors expect. and. That's where we had to be careful not to let those signals over inform yep. what we were building. But my, uh, I had a strong conviction when I started working on this that there were ways to remove barriers and create incentives for the adoption of regenerative agriculture. And like it or not, we live in a capitalist system. And so how can we use the playbook of capitalism to accelerate that? because ultimately that's where there are incentives for people to start investing and to further uh, 
these types of missions. And so the that was a little bit of a challenge of like, all right, how do we make capitalism like regenerative agriculture? Like even saying that as a sentence kind of feels dirty to say, but if we wanted to make it mainstream, if we want to uh, have more people participate, if we want farmers to be profitable and have longevity in their businesses over the long run, we need to prioritize those things. And so um, things like uh, achieving an appropriate take rate, um, recurring revenue models, those were some of the things we thought about incorporating into the ongoing aspects of our business. Using tech to enable efficiency yep. is another one we had to think about. And so um, I would say some of the signals we ended up taking from what does venture want were tech enabled, um, metric signals, revenue, take rate, um, uh, recurring revenue models. We took some of those metrics and apply that to how do we build a business that can generate these metrics, which are a signal of investability and a signal of longevity and a signal of a thriving business? Because we want to build a business that's thriving and has longevity and is investable. So that's where we need to build a business model that delivers some of those metrics. How long did that process take? Uh, four to six weeks. Um, I spent some time fussing around with financial models, doing a lot of reading from financial models of other businesses. I read some university case studies on organic and regenerative farms and what their balance sheets look like. And all those signals gave us some of the financial inputs that we needed to build the business model from there. And are you doing this all alone? Are you helping, uh, taking help from advisors, mentors, connectors, mm -hmm. or are you just like, yeah. I'm going to do this all, all myself? Um, I use we, as, I say we a lot to refer to myself, uh, but also I've had, uh, so let me just, uh, where's the story start? One of the things that I saw early in this journey of learning about regenerative agriculture was the documentary Kiss the Ground. Okay. The follow-up film Common Ground premiered in Austin in October at the Paramount Theater. And you better bet that I was going to be there. So yeah. I got my tickets with a few friends. We all went to this documentary screening, had a wonderful time, and had the opportunity at the end to jump on a mic and ask some questions. Okay. Nice. Many people wanted to just kind of get up and be like, I was so inspired. I didn't know. Yeah all those epiphany moments that I had when I first saw the film and was first learning about regenerative ag and the, uh, but I was like, Hey, I, I appreciate that you're all inspired. I got a real question and uh, ended up having the opportunity to meet some folks uh, affiliated with that film as part of building our extended advisory team to help guide this. So Alan okay. Williams of Understanding nice. Ag, Alejandro Carrillo of Desert Grasslands Ranch out of uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, um, among others have been helpful resources in building this extended advisory team that keeps us on track and focused on the needs of farmers. I think what I was just trying to get at is you're, you're gonna need to find the right mm -hmm. partners, right advisors along the mm -hmm. way who not only understand the industry, but understand what you're trying to build, mm -hmm. right? Because I think it's very easy for an advisor to not know anything about you, but just be like a tech advisor, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe they're giving you good advice, but the way you're building your mission, like maybe you need a hacky solution here, you need something to figure out there. Mm -hmm. And you need to find the right kind of mentor, mm -hmm. advisor to like nurture you along the yeah. journey, right? So. And I'm. I had spent some time early in the process of looking for a co-founder and had interviewed a few people, had done some short sprint projects. Yeah. Ultimately- Co-founder dating. Yeah, co-founder dating, yes. Ultimately, everyone wanted me to buy them dinner uh, to the tune of a six-figure salary. And I was yeah. like, the level of commitment I have to this is such that yeah. I'm working on sweat equity here and I need someone who's going to be equally yeah. yoked in that process. And that means you're not getting a six figure salary right now. Um, and so those signals made it really clear that I at least haven't encountered that right co-founder yeah. who is gonna show that same level of commitment uh, that I'm at right now. 
but I'm open to that person being out there. So if you're out there, yeah. call me. Um, but there's, you know, I want someone who's excited to be working on this and not just in it for a paycheck. 100%. 100%. And I feel like there are probably times where getting someone just pure paycheck makes sense. But at that point, you figured a lot of things out and you just need execution and mm -hmm. operators. Mm -hmm. You don't need like, hey, let's figure out what we're building. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're like, hey, we'd validated, done, model, everything works. We just need to go and like go down this path. Mm -hmm. Maybe at that point, it makes sense to get someone who's more of an ex executive, um, executor. But... No, yeah, 100% agree that and I they think, should be. Yeah. In, yeah. I think there's also a situation where your co-founder can really bring some of that industry credibility or maybe you're at a stage in their career where they are more mission oriented. Yeah. And so they're like, I'm going to start on this kind of sweat equity journey, even though I'm bringing all this great experience yeah. and credentials and titles uh, I really care about this problem. But that person is just as motivated as maybe the young person who's just getting started in that industry. Bringing them together is a really beautiful thing. And I'm fortunate that in my advisory team, I have a lot of industry veterans on my side. I like that. So you figured out the idea, you know you want to do marketplace, you have advisors. How do you attack? Are you still at Antler at this point or is Antler over? Uh, we figured out the business model after Antler had okay. finished off, Got yeah, it. which was part of why we ended up not pitching Antler yeah. at the time Pretty because we yeah, had yeah. Uh, kind of figured out we hadn't gotten all the pieces together, especially since I was pretty sick yeah. right in the middle of the program. So I lost a little time there. Makes sense. And so what, what's the next step after this? We're in the next step. Uh, so we've validated, well, I'll, I'll go back even further. So we've built this business model, validated uh, some of the revenue questions. How do you make money? Yeah. What is your exit strategy? Those types of things. Once we have answers to all those questions, can we illustrate demand on the marketplace? Can we illustrate that we have supply? Can we illustrate that we have demand? Can we with some level of confidence, envision a process where we can acquire what we need on both sides of that marketplace. And so we went and got um, landowner letters of intent, signed, non-binding, nice. and got enough of them through founder-led sales in my network and nice. people who had informed some of our conversations about the problem statement we're addressing. As we did customer discovery, we met a lot of people who had the problem that we were trying to solve. And so we had built advocates in those people and also in their network. I started getting calls from people asking, hey, you know, I'm selling my farm. I'm trying to find the next person to manage the farm. Can you do this in California? Can you do this in Ohio? Can you do this in Indiana? Can you do this in South Carolina? And I've stopped collecting letters of intent because I didn't want to put the signal out there that we were like ready to go. But that was a really positive signal yeah. to hear that we were having people call us, even through just a few of these Makes conversations sense. that we had met. Uh, and then on the uh, land steward side, that really felt like a recruiting process, probably in a way that didn't feel uh, when I talk to people about that side of the marketplace, they're almost surprised. Like, oh, you can just recruit for farm managers. To an extent, yes, it's a title of a job that exists. It's tough to find. Uh, there's also this central piece to our mission of how do you bring the next generation into that. Again, a lot of farm managers are in that aging group that if we don't create a new workforce to sustain some of those skill sets, we're gonna have a problem as we transition yeah. our food supply chain. And so, um, you know, thinking through one, how do you recruit people? Uh, how do you train them? How do you make sure that their experience on the farm or their interest in it is validated by other outdoor work experiences? And those are some of the ways we make sure it's not just a sort of idyllic, like romantic idea about what farming and ranching should be but yeah. actually a commitment to working outside a commitment nice. to nature that's already come out in 
their resume before. And so when we saw that demand on both sides, uh, went and did some pre-sales and we're like, okay, we have done, got, we've gotten signals on every side of this marketplace that say people are interested in buying these products, people are interested in growing them, people are interested in making their land available. Let's go fundraise and do it. Okay. And so currently you're in the fundraising we're process? In, we're in fundraising mode right nice. now. Nice. So that had, uh, we started preparing for fundraising mode, February, March timeframe, making versions of the pitch deck, pitching it to all the wrong types of investors. Intentionally, I spent about a month pitching kind of SaaS vendors, knowing they didn't know anything about this space, knowing they didn't know anything about marketplaces. But that forced me to get really good at explaining this to folks who didn't understand it. I remember at GE, they had a holiday promotion where they wanted people to ask their family members at the holidays, hey, what's your, what do you think your job is at GE? Yeah. Um, I think you know, a great prompt is, can you explain your business to your Uber driver? And if it's not simple enough for you to be able to do that, your, your communication needs some tweaking. And so I got to practice that with investors who don't invest in my space. How can I educate them? Are they understanding my problem? And I know I was getting closer to that when I would say a few sentences, then they'd explain the business model to me. I'm like, okay, nice. it's resonating. Nice. Yes. Pretty cool. Um, do you want to say what kind of round you're raising and mm -hmm. you can plug all that as well? Yeah. Downland's raising a million dollar round on a $5 million valuation cap. We have about 70% of that uh, subscribed and are looking for a lead investor and have slots for small follow-ons beyond that. Uh, one of the things that's really important to me is uh, providing access to a lot of people to participate. My dad worked at a bowling alley and my mom worked at a gas station. So when people were like, start your company with friends and family money, that's always felt incredibly tone deaf to me. And so we are also raising on a crowd fund, while that's not a material part of our overall fundraising strategy, it's an important and easy way for folks to get involved at a variety of entry points. So uh, you can check that out at wefunder.com slash And we'll, yeah, we'll link yeah. everything, yeah. Um, sweet. Uh, that's cool. And you said 70% oh, of the million subscribers, so now you're just, um, do you have commitments for the rest or are you doing more investor calls or what are you doing? We're doing investor calls as we speak. Yeah. Nice. Pretty cool. Yes. It's been super fun, especially speaking with the right kinds of investors. That's another piece of advice I would give is I knew I was pitching the wrong kind of investors to get practice, but that also gave me a little recency bias of like, oh, like, is this investable? Yeah. Like, is this something that people care about? Qualifying investors is incredibly important. You will kiss a lot of, you can qualify investors by kissing a lot of frogs first, but uh, you're perhaps gonna save yourself some heartache by finding the right kinds of investors and going to to those folks because they can refer amongst themselves, but also will more quickly understand your space and your problem statement and the yes will be a lot easier. I have this thesis that you should take money from the right person mm -hmm. and not just any money. Yes. But it's it's easy for me to say that from a point of view of where I'm not raising. Let's say you were raising a million and you got a 500K check from someone who may not be the best investor, but that's half your round. Mm -hmm. And if you get that 500, it's easier to get the other 500 if you have someone who's already. And so maybe you take a check, but if that investor is a pain in the ass down the line, is it worth it? I don't know. But again, this is easier for me to say from a point of view of yeah. where I'm not actively raising yeah. anything for myself. Yeah. But I do agree that the right investor can make leaps and bounds of a difference in your success and your company success. But you just got to know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. into. Um, yeah. I've, I don't have firsthand experience of working with an investor that is not a good fit, but it's one of the top two or three pieces of advice I've gotten fundraising is to avoid investors who are gonna make odd demands yep. or have bad terms or take high ownership or have you start a board too early or have you priced your round 
too low or have you price it too high. So there's a lot of signals I've gotten about avoiding that sort of scenario. And I've had to turn down some of those and it's tough because it's like, man, I, I would really like your $5 million check, but I really think it's imprudent to value my company at that size. And that's maybe, you know, those things are still on the back burner, yeah. I guess, if you get really desperate, but uh, that's kind of one solid piece of advice that I've gotten. Nice. Only other thing I'll say about um, raising money is there's this person I met in SF who talked about their board forcing them to get a CPO and he was against it. He was like, do it, trust us, trust us. Spent 500K hiring and firing a CPO mm -hmm. and lost six months of time. And again, I don't understand this dynamic completely, but at the end of it, it is my company, my startup, mm -hmm. and I should be able to make the decisions that I think are right. Mm -hmm. If I really understand the space, Yes, I will take the board's um, opinion into question. I will, you know, look at what they're asking me to do. But at the end of it, if I don't feel right about something, I shouldn't be forced to do something because mm -hmm. the investor said I should or the board mm -hmm. said I should. Maybe that line of thinking is wrong. I don't think everyone agrees with that. Mm -hmm. But while it's my company and I own majority and I I should feel comfortable making the decisions I think mm -hmm. are right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are one of but the yeah. things that when I talk to other entrepreneurs, a lot of advice I get is bootstrap as long as you can. Yeah. Take mission aligned investors. And I think it comes from folks who've had to have those hard negotiations or take the phone calls yeah. where you have to sort of indulge someone's idea or perspective despite its proximity to what you're actually trying to accomplish 100%. in your business. So there's, I think there's like a, you know, postmodern venture capital perspective in the zeitgeist of, you know, how, what does it take to start big successful companies without some of that burden of venture capital investors? I don't know that entrepreneurs have, I'm curious if entrepreneurs have enough leverage to make that completely happen right now, yeah. but perhaps serial entrepreneurs yeah. do. 100%. Um, so I'm very interested to see how, I, I'm curious to see how that plays out over time. Um, but the barriers to entry for entrepreneurs are so high that venture capital does provide things that you really do need, especially 100%. in terms of funds. 100%. Sweet. Um, I'll do, I like to do some rapid fire questions at the end. So I'll just shoot them at you and let me know what you think. What are three resources that you'd recommend for folks starting out, folks early in their journey? Tools you use already. Uh, don't try and get too fancy with how you're tracking interviews or how you're tracking fundraising conversations. Use the CRM you already like. Use the note-taking app you already like. Don't get fancy with it. Uh, the second resource I'd recommend is ReaderWise or Reader. Uh, it's an app where you can save articles. Readwise, yeah. Readwise, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, Readwise is another tool I'd recommend. That's a tool that helps you save articles and videos and play them back later. I'm someone who reads a lot of research and science in the space that I'm in. And so getting overviews of studies and articles is something that is super important for me to stay up to date on. But tough to stare at a computer screen and do that. So that's a, another tool I'd recommend. Um, third is Phantom Buster. Phantom Buster has been a great tool for cold outreach, especially with regard to investor conversations. Nice. Um, you can generate connections on LinkedIn. You can generate cold messages. You can scrape emails. It's been a really useful tool for getting conversations and broad outreach automated really easily. Nice. What's your startup stack or tech stack? How mm -hmm. do you run your company? And yeah. Like go through the tools you use. Yeah. Um, Google Sheets. <laughs> uh, Google Slides. Um, that's it. Okay. Text messages. Nice. LinkedIn. Nice. Email. Um, Nothing. The, the reason I like that yeah. is some people get into this, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? I'm mm -hmm. like, can keep yeah. it super simple. You know, Excel does a lot of stuff. Yes. 
Excel can be your CRM. Yes. And like, I feel like people get into analysis paralysis of like, well, this tool does this. I'm yeah. like, start with an Excel. Yeah. And when you hit a limitation, you move on to something. When you hit a limitation, you yes. move on. Yeah. I think, uh, especially with regard to using expanding my skill set. I've worked with a lot of offshore talent in the past. I've worked with a lot of consultants in the past. Upwork has been a great resource for finding people who can extend your skill set, especially on the things you don't love doing. Um, I can do a basic financial model, but when I need the fancy version, like I need someone to supplement me a little bit. Yeah. And so Upwork's been a great resource for that. Front has also been a really great way to manage my email, uh, send yeah. emails later. I mentioned that I work seven days a yeah. week often front is an app i've never heard uh, of front. front is an okay. email app where okay, you can sweet. manage multiple out. email addresses in one okay, front nice. end without nice. like logging out and logging nice, in nice. um it's been great for message templating for using this feature called snooze where you send an email but it pops back in your inbox you know whenever you set that alarm yeah. later and that's been a great way to make sure that I'm following oh, up yeah. when I have a lot of stuff. And also having other email addresses kind of on the side nice. in other places when I need to keep an eye on I like other that. stuff. Yeah. What's your support system? What I think you covered this briefly, but how do you keep going? How are you on mm -hmm. this journey? What's your support system? Yeah, I've been fortunate to have a lot of friendships uh, who support me. My gym community is really supportive. Other folks that I've worked, uh, my LinkedIn network has been supportive. I've been sharing a lot on there. Nice. My newsletter readers have been really supportive. I've gotten letters or I've gotten emails from old college professors who read my newsletter and tell me how much they like reading my writing, which is an ultimate compliment to get from your creative writing professor. And it's like 10 years of them and got it. Yes. Got them. Yes. I'm like, Dr. Romano, thank you. Um, I do it all for you. <laughs> but uh, so that's been, a, you know, sort of a concentric onion of like people that are really close yeah. to you who get what you're doing and just people who care about the space, nice. believe in you, have seen you perform, cheering you on. Those are great validations as well. Nice. I've mentioned keeping a lot of my other routines in place but, as yeah. well. So um, my fitness routine, my sleep routine, my meal routine, all of which I have accountability with with my husband. Nice. So he sees every Is day. Is he also into CrossFit? Doing bodybuilding right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, Bulking, cutting. Yes, he's doing all that. He's doing a great job. Nice. Um, but he supports a lot of the things that need done at the house, whether that's like cleaning, cooking, laundry. He has a meal prep business on the side. Nice. And so we talk about food all the time. Nice. Um, so having all those other pieces in place has been really wonderful. And then on the days when I just need to cry, <laughs> you know, he's there too. And I can be like, Hey, uh, today was a rough one. Like, can, you know, can you I have a hug? Sit in silence yeah. and cry. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I need to cry. I'm okay. I just got to get it out. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. And I, I do this bit where I ask everyone a last question. Yeah. So your question from a previous guest is who is the last advisor or mentor? that went out of their way for you and did something nice for you that just made your day? Or mm. I got the opportunity to spend time with one of my advisors, Alejandro Carrillo, during a long drive to a dinner after an event. And he didn't do this on purpose. It just came out of him. It was like a maestro at work. We were driving past these landscapes that were desertified and had different problems with them, invasive species growing yeah. up, things like that. He's an expert in ranching, restoring desertified environments. So out of the peripheral of his eye, he can see, oh, there's plants growing here that should not be growing here. He pulled to the side of the road and pointed out to me like, Jesse, this plant is here because of this and this plant is here because of that inside the fence was more destroyed and desertified than outside the fence there was a difference in how the roadside grass and uh, plants were being taken care of or not bothered yeah. versus inside the fence and so it was really special to see him light up and tell me nice. about all the work that he's doing pretty cool and what's uh, what's your question for a future guest of mine? I feel like mine is more is not special, uh, or it's a silly one. Yeah. What's a show that you? Um, what's a show that other people get into that you're not into at all? What's your answer? 
Game of Thrones. Okay. Uh, you and my wife would relate a lot. That. <laughs> I think I would actually like it, but I just have, am daunted by the duration and pace of it and all the things I've heard yeah, about I that. I like this. It's, it's my first non-deep question. Everything else, like, what's your mission? What's this? What's that? Yeah. Um, I would say mine right now would be Modern Family. Like, my wife really likes yeah. Modern Family. I never, I yeah. never got it. I Parks and Rec, I had the same experience with. Where, I've never seen Parks and Rec. Yeah, and I'm like, I love The Office. People are like, yeah, you'd love Parks and Rec. Like, I kind of, like a lot of my friends kind of banter in that yeah. same way. I'm like, they're but like, get past the first season. I'm like, that's not the point. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Breaking Bad too. I mean, I mm-hmm. watched Breaking Bad, but yeah. I was like, it was a little too slow for me. Mm-hmm. Did you binge it or did you watch it? I binged it. it. I binged yeah. it in three days. Yes. All yeah. five seasons. Yeah. I, that's such a different experience of like yeah. consuming media in that yeah. way. And you feel, you feel the pace in a really yeah. different way. Like we just watched Dune yeah. across three days though. Cause it's so long. Well, thank you for coming on. That's all I had for you. Where can listeners reach out? What do you want to plug? And we'll yeah. link everything in the description. But You can follow me on LinkedIn at uh, Jesse Resch, R-O-E-S-C-H. Uh, Jesse Resch rhymes with fresh is my slug on my LinkedIn page. Uh, you can join our newsletter. Uh, you can... Uh, joining our newsletter is a great way to follow along with what we're doing. Nice. You can also join our crowdfund at wefunder.com slash downland. Sweet. And we'll link everything, but... Thank you for coming on. I appreciated the conversation and I hope you had fun. This was so fun. Thank you. Thanks.